Hi, all of you wonderful scuba divers out there. Welcome to the Scuba Diver Magazine podcast, where I break down the latest scuba diving news and just things that have piqued my interest over the previous week. The podcast is sponsored by the scuba diving giant Scuba Pro, who manufacture a wide range of diving equipment for entry-level scuba divers experiencing the underwater world for the first time to advanced technical divers and professional scuba divers as well. I'll talk more about Scuba Pro later on in this podcast. This week on the podcast, two separate, very experienced cave divers have been recovered after they died exploring separate underwater cave systems. Dan Europe has activated a new way to get in contact with them in emergencies, and Historic England are implementing a new theft deterrent on valuable artifacts on shipwrecks. So first up, the body of diver Brett Hempel, who went missing during an exploratory dive in Phantom Springs Cave in West Texas on the 4th of October, has been recovered by members of his own cast underwater research dive team. So Hempel, who was 56, and his fellow divers had set out to explore a lead about 2.2 kilometers into the system, starting at 135 meters. Um, I say starting at 135 as if that's a small thing. Um, he was last seen on video tying off the guideline on a rock at a US record breaking depth of 174 meters. But after that, he and the other divers had become separated. The Kerr team had stated that the effort to find and extract Hempel would involve the assistance of a number of recovery divers, in some cases traveling thousands of miles to the site. Led by Kerr director Andy Pitkin, the team found their colleague at a depth of more than 135 meters on the evening on the 8th of October. In a statement, from Pitkin after the recovery mission, he said, when we have got all of the information and analyzed it, we will issue a statement about the incidents that will answer everyone's questions. Until then, please allow us some time to come to terms with his loss, as up until now, we have been focused on the recovery. Hempel and Kerr divers had set the US deep underwater cave record at Wiki Wat Chi Cave Springs in uh, in Florida in 2008 before breaking their own record in 2013 with 140 meter descent and two and a half kilometer penetration also at Phantom Springs. These are the United States deepest natural caves and they're also very challenging for divers because of the complexity of the flooded passages and sometimes strong currents as well that they have to contend with. Hempel was president of the Florida-based KUR, and he and the team are very well known in the cave diving community for their success in exploring, mapping, and documenting deep underwater systems in Florida, Texas, and Missouri, as well as overseas in the Bahamas, the Dominican Republic, and Mexico. Pitkin started cave and technical diving here in the UK in 1994, and in 2007 moved to Florida, where he has taken part in numerous KUR underwater cave exploration projects. And in similar news, one of China's best-known scuba divers has been presumed dead six days after going missing in the deep Chiang Chuang flooded system, uh, cave system uh, in the south of China. Uh, Hang Tin had been building up for a bid to attain a world record depth in the system. A search and rescue team have now reported finding a body, though it has yet to be officially confirmed as his. Hanting went missing after he went on a training dive at about 8pm on the 7th of October. When he didn't return the following morning, his companions uh, alerted rescue services. Members of the Flag Blue Diving Club, founded by Hanting, also joined the rescue operation. On the afternoon of the 11th of October, the dive team involved in the search released a statement saying that Hang had not been found. Uh, divers involved in the search highlighted that the entire rescue operation in the the cave was very difficult uh, due to the great depth and no significant progress had been made neither. Uh, a little bit later on the same day another announcement was made from the information provided we know that during a search with a ROV a little underwater robot uh, rescuers came across the body of a 
diver. The diver, unidentified at the moment, was trapped in the cave at a depth of 110 metres. Uh, the rescuers then started preparing a plan to reach the body and bring it to the surface. But as of yet, I, uh, I haven't found a news article to confirm or deny um, whether it was Han or not. So a lot of humbling news. Um, yeah, I've, I've been away for a, a week and I come back looking for uh, news stories and, um, and yeah, two very big um, cave diving uh, names have uh, have been lost. And um, I think I saw another news story in, oh, I think it was Boston, and two very experienced divers went on a very average dive not too not particularly deep um not challenging it was just off the coast and both of them died apparently so a lot of people are uh just trying to work out what might have happened um so yeah stay humble out there obviously um now that the weather's turning in the northern hemisphere it's getting a bit um sort of colder uh yeah just make sure that you're you're being safe and your gears all uh, maintained it's all up to scratch and uh yeah just look after yourselves and your buddies out there and with that, Divers Alert Network Europe have introduced a new service that allows DAN members to call the emergency hotline via the internet or through 4G and 5G and all that. Um, this makes it now possible to contact the alarm centre even when like mobile and cellular signal is poor. And it also allows long-distance calls be, to be made without incurring um, excessive costs uh, because you're not dialing up the number, you're just doing it through the uh, the internet, um, unless, you, of course, you're worried about like roaming charges and whatnot. But anyway, uh, the Alarm Centre can be contacted via the Dan Europe app, uh, directly calling the emergency numbers, international and local, on your digital membership card, or from the web page dedicated to emergencies. Uh, so yeah, just a new way that you can contact Dan. If you're ever, ever worried about anything, you want some advice, uh, you feel a, an unusual tingle or something, uh, it's always best to, uh, to contact them um, about any kind of diving emergencies. And finally for the news, as we mark the 50th anniversary of the Protection of Rex Act 1973 here in the UK, Historic England continues to research new and innovative approaches to reduce the risk and tackle heritage crime at sea. So for the first time in the UK, Historic England is using new technology to forensically mark artifacts, including cannons from some of England's 57 most historic and archaeologically important protected shipwrecks, marking these artifacts gives them even greater protection as they will now be traceable. So if someone does lift them and nick them and then go to sell them, uh, they're literally marked. Um, so the project by Historic England's working with MSDS Marine and the Cultural Heritage Agency of the Netherlands uh, and other partners, is sending a direct message to potential thieves that underwater artefacts such as cannons on protected shipwrecks are basically too hot to handle. So the new approach forms part of the Heritage Watch scheme, which aims to prevent and detect heritage crime in local areas and encourages the public to use their eyes and ears to look after our cultural heritage. In 2021, damage to the protected wreck site of the 17th century Dutch warship the Klein Hollandia was documented by divers from the Nautical Archaeological Society, which led to a joint decision by the Cultural Heritage Agency of the Netherlands and Historic England to support further investigation of the wreck. They also agreed to continue to work towards new technology to make artifacts traceable, but leaving them in place. So this is a significant development. Uh, this is a significant development in the protection of vulnerable underwater archaeological sites. Mark Harrison, who's the head of Heritage Crime Strategy for Historic England, said this will act as a clear deterrent to those looking to unlawfully lift and remove historic material from protected wreck sites. If someone breaks the law and removes any property, the new markings will give police the ability to link the offender to the crime scene and implement criminal proceedings. So there are several things that they're doing, but there's a new product that's been trialed on dives this summer and is similar to the kind of traceable products used to mark lead on church roofs at risk of theft and uh, trace artifacts back to a particular site. So what they're doing is they're marking these items and artifacts with a very special um, solution that they kind of squeeze onto uh, certain patches of the... Uh, 
of the item of the artifact, and this marking is permanent, obviously. Uh, there is a, a more obvious, um, uh, I can't really think of the word, but like a, a sign that they're attaching to it, which is, it literally states, this site is forensically marked, look but don't touch. Uh, and it has information about um, MSDS Marine, Nautical Archaeological Society and Heritage Watch and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's really obvious that, you know what, you can look at this, uh, you can take photos, but um, yeah, this item is marked, so there's no point in uh, in lifting it because if you try and sell it, um, then yeah, you can get in some very hot water. And yeah, they're looking to uh, to roll this out further for uh, for more uh, shipwrecks. And um, yeah, it is because I mean there there were news stories a a few years ago now thinking about it where um, yeah divers were just lifting cannons and uh, and anything else that they that they could basically and then trying to sell it on but yeah as soon as the uh, the police catch wind uh yeah they're uh, they're in jail now or prison I, I never really understood the difference between jail and prison um but yes um it's it's a good step forward to uh, to help prevent marine theft of uh, of our marine artifacts Onto new equipment and fourth element have a new mask out, their Seeker mask. So this is fourth element's first mask that they've purely designed themselves. I think the previous, um, the the Scout, the Navigator, uh, and the the other one um, weren't one hundred percent them. Whereas this is now what fourth element really want uh, sort of all in one thing and it's a smart looking mask and we tested it out uh, the other week but seeker was designed with two main objectives to maximize the diver's field of vision to be as close as possible to the experience of not wearing a mask at all uh, with a single lens and to basically fit everybody because that's always the main complaint of oh i really like this mask but it doesn't actually fit me and it doesn't it doesn't look weird um it, it's a sensible looking mask uh but when we were when we were testing it one thing that you notice is that you can't see uh, you can't see the top edges of it at all no matter how hard you you try basically um so it's basically like diving with a sunroof so you can actually you've got more light coming from the uh, from the top which is very unusual um it's a, a frameless mask and it comes in for the three colors. Uh, you get the like gunmetal gray or just like slate gray, uh, standard black, obviously. And you also get the like petrol blue kind of colorway. Um, oh, yeah, there is a fourth option, which is the, the contrast. So if you remember, the, uh, the Scout comes with four different lenses, the Seeker comes with clarity which is their uh, their premium um like optical grade glass and then you get contrast which has a lens treatment that's better for uh like colder greener waters the seeker comes with a traditional silicone mask strap like most masks do uh, but obviously it is uh, compatible with fourth elements uh, fabric elastic strap and um, yeah if you want to read our review I'll, uh, I'll pop a link to that down in the description below uh, but yeah it is a good looking mask and it is interesting to see uh, fourth element branching out further and they, they really are leaning into the um, like mask fins and snorkel route as opposed to just like exposure protection and bags and stuff uh, they're becoming a bit more of a, a comprehensive scuba brand uh, they also released uh, whilst I was away the um, the updates to their dry suit so now there's the Argonaut 3.0 um, which I mean, the main difference that you're going to see is the blue coloration to it it's the same blue as the uh, the new Seeker mask but you do get a choice uh, you can have it in standard black or like a gray a, a lighter blue and then a, a darker blue and you can choose different colors on the top and the bottom so that gives you a, a bit of choice there are a few upgrades on it um, they changed the tailoring on the legs that seems to be the main upgrade to uh, to allow for greater flexibility and movement in the water uh, they've tweaked the tailoring to the uh, the top side as well just to make it a bit more comfortable and practical uh, upgraded or just 
different valves. I think they've got Apollo valves on them now. Uh, you probably do get a choice, but yeah, Apollo are now available. And dry glove ring systems. Uh, you get a few different um, choices now instead of just the uh, the standard uh, Cytec. Uh, quick cuff system QCS yeah quick cuff system um, now there's a, a new one which I've forgotten the name of it um, but you get uh, you get a choice otherwise similar to uh, to what you know um, they chose their stealth fabric which is lightweight but hard wearing and has a good combination of stretch and li uh, lightweight durability whilst the flex fabric is uh, is specially engineered for durability and comfort uh, to create a uh, really rugged suit that lasts forever so yeah a couple new things from fourth element that's always exciting to see Otherwise, pretty quiet as far as new uh, new scuba gear. Uh, it was really those two uh, two things being quite um, uh, being released this week, or at least last week. Um, we do have a, a survey. We uh, we want to know your opinion, and there's a little incentive. Um, it's basically a um, a reader survey. We want to know what uh, what you wonderful scuba divers uh, get up to and what you want to see in our uh, our magazine on the youtube channel and yeah in the in the podcast if you want any um, changes um yeah it only takes about five ten minutes uh, it's completely anonymous and if you want to you can enter to win a uh, a, a shearwater terrick uh, dive computer um it's um yeah basically if you fill out the uh, the survey and obviously, you want to uh, to enter the uh, the competition, uh, then yeah, you can win a um, a Shearwater Terrick. Uh, the survey is running up until the end of the year, so you've got until December thirty first, twenty twenty three, uh, to uh, to put your survey through. Um, but yeah, good luck if you're um, uh, if you're taking part. So as I mentioned at the start of the podcast, I'm going to talk briefly about Scuba Pro. Scuba Pro was founded in 1963 by Gustav Dallavale and Dick Bonin, and in 2023, they see their 60th anniversary, and Scuba Pro is stronger than ever. Today, Scuba Pro is a global brand, and you'll find them around any dive site or dive boat because scuba divers around the world just trust Scuba Pro as a brand. I personally have never had a problem recommending any Scuba Pro dive equipment to anyone asking. I used it whilst I was scuba diving and teaching and so did all of my students as well. They were using Scuba Pro equipment and no matter where you are in the world, it won't be hard to find a service center because they're located all over the world. The divers are Scuba Pro's inspiration. Every product, every enhancement, every decision, everything that they do is designed to make your diving experience the best that it can be. Because without this blue planet of divers eager to explore, their innovations mean nothing. And Scuba Pro want to thank you for being part of their journey and for being their inspiration for the future. They are so excited to share their latest innovations with you. The best is yet to come. A few big things this year have been the Ulex range of wetsuits that use a plant-based foam instead of neoprene, which is better for the planet, and the Estec fins, which are a more technical focused fin, a bit of a hybrid between the Sea Wing Nova and the Jet fin. One really cool feature is that you can actually adjust their buoyancy by adding or removing little metal plates in the fin before the dive. But for more information, head over to scubapro.com. On to questions, uh, ask Mark questions that, um, that that are a bit too short to, uh, to make a full video on. Um, Mark Gardner 8881 says, Hi Mark, thanks. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Any chance you can do a video on how to clean the inside of a dry suit? Uh, mine is a neoprene one, uh, if that makes a difference. Um, yeah, just soap. Um, give, give it a, a good wash. Uh, it's more about like drying and airing it. Um, so if it's neoprene, chances are it's got integrated boots. So you want to hang it upside down. And a lot of divers build a little frame. I say little. Um, build a frame out of like PVC pipe, like old guttering. Well, probably not old guttering. It's best to use new. Um, and if you like rig it up and drill holes in uh, in key areas and then blow warm air it can just yeah flush 
uh, all of that uh, that moisture out. But yeah, you you want something that's uh, like a detergent that's antimicrobial, antifungal, and um, and yeah, give give it a. It's quite hard to scrub the inside of a suit, um, so make a nice like warmy solution. Pour it in. Uh, it is going to take a, a few days to um, to dry out properly, depending on um, on what method you're you're using. But yeah, just something like a good detergent. You can get like wetsuit and dry suit shampoo, which is antifungal and antimicrobial. Uh, wash that. Make up a a nice warm solution of that. Throw that in the suit. Um, give it a scrub if you can. Um, like get your arms in there, down to the feet and everything, and uh, and kind of give it a a, a sensible scrub. And um, yeah, then um, hang it upside down, ideally, so that all the uh, the moisture from the boots can go down and uh, and drip dry through. You don't have to worry too much about the valves or anything because they're all waterproof on the inside and the outside. Um, and yeah, just look after your, your seals, your, your cuff seals and your neck seals. Um, I'd probably take the valves off if you're, if you're giving it a full clean, then you might as well go like full on and, uh, and give them a good like flush through just to make sure there's no, uh, no salt or verdigris or anything building up inside of them. Um, but otherwise, yeah, it mainly comes down to drying. So, uh, so hang it up upside down ideally and if you can get some kind of airflow running through it there are a few different um like wetsuit dry suit hangers that have fans built into them the main one uh, the one that we used to sell at simply scuba was called the hang air uh, there are others available now you um you see more and more on like social media and all that kind of stuff um i can't comment on uh, on their effectability Effectability is that a word? Um, effectiveness. Um, I can't comment because I've only ever used hang air. And um, yeah, it's just a really broad coat hanger and it has a fan built into the like neck. So you hang it up, you plug it in, and it just blows air continually into the suit. And that helps to like dehumidify it and get all the moisture out. Uh, but yeah, you've got to kill the nasties and they get into all the little nooks and crannies. Uh, so make up a nice warm soapy solution and, um, and yeah, really sort of flood the suit and then, uh, then hang it up to dry. Michael, uh, Krautvar says, hi Mark, what about those multi-layer materials such as Mara's ultra skin? Uh, can they be considered as a substitute for thinner neoprene or are they more like rash guards with some added thermal protection? Uh, I'm looking for some two to three mil gloves and hood and these ultra skins look like interesting options. Uh, yeah, it's, um, we, we've got quite a few of these neoprene alternatives now. Um, it's, started with oh well I say it started with my career um that I was aware of I think it started with um thermo no not yeah it must have been thermocline from fourth element uh then there was lava core and shark skin obviously uh Mara's have ultra skin which is similar so um yeah, they are, most divers find them equivalent to about two or three mil gloves. So you're pretty much on the um, um, on the ball here with them. Uh, so yeah, it, it's a good neoprene alternative and they're effective and they're, they're useful on the surface as well because they're windproof and uh, yeah, they, they help to, uh, to keep your hands warm. You can wear them as wet gloves. You can wear them as a dry glove liner as well, which is handy. So they're a great all rounder. Whereas neoprene gloves, they can get a bit um, like sweaty if you wear them on the surface. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're definitely a, a good option. Underwater Sojourns 2581, I think is how you break up that um, that handle. Um, but they say, uh, I'd like to ask, how are you keeping your transmitter safe from being grabbed like a handle or being physically damaged in general? I wanted to know if there are other or better ways of doing it. Mine is currently attached to a six inch hose and bent and tucked inwards using a bungee cord. Thanks for answering. Um, yeah, you basically found it. I mean, that's the usual thing. You can attach your transmitter directly onto the first stage to minimize failure points. But if you're not the one handing your gear, 
a lot of um, like boat handlers and uh, and divers go straight for like the tank valve and it's quite easy for them just to grab onto your transmitter and if you if you put all of the weight of that bcd with like integrated weights as well uh, it's really easy just to uh, just to snap that transmitter off or at least um, uh, bruise those uh, those threads so um, yeah six inch hose is usually the uh, the recommendation uh, bunging it rounds is quite handy to prevent it from like flapping around and banging against stuff but that's pretty much it unfortunately you can get some high pressure quick disconnects um which of course it has to be depressurized to be able to de disconnect it uh so it wouldn't be like in the water something you can do um but yeah that's that's really it you've um you've already found it is like attach it to a short hose that way it's flexible so even if someone does grab at it it's uh, it's going to move and it's not going to uh, to put too much uh like strain or stress on those threads uh you could put it on a really long hose uh that would help with any uh, connectivity issues because they do have fairly limited ranges and if it is tucked away sometimes you can get a little bit of interference but uh, touch wood I've never had an issue having on a, a six inch hose uh, that that really is your your best option and finally energy uh, energy ZLP uh, says I bought the Aqualung i770R dive computer uh, used so unfortunately it's difficult to exchange yet um, seems to have a problem on the surface it showed 33 degrees whereas uh only had 22 degrees um, in the water it shows much too warm temperatures for the first 20 minutes after 20 minutes the temperature display is correct uh, compared to a separate dive computer an i330r and a, C on, uh, a Sunto Eon core do you have any idea what could be causing this common failure how can I fix it warranty is over uh, the latest firmware is on its uh, water type is set correctly um, I've personally never found thermometers on dive computers to be particularly accurate um, half of the time they're picking up your body heat uh, if they're mounted directly onto your wrist uh, other times it takes so long for the sensor to pick up the temperature because of all of the like protection around it um, and it's it's not overly important for me to know the um, I suppose it is a little bit important um, but no, it is fairly common. I, I've lost count the number of divers who have said, "Oh, my dive computer, um, the uh, the temperature is different to uh, to what it actually is." Uh, it's unusual to have like ten degrees out. I'm assuming that's centigrade if it's thirty three and twenty two degrees centigrade. Um, but yeah, ten degrees is pretty high. Normally, it will be like two or three off, which it is a little bit excusable when it's 10 degrees it's kind of annoying but it doesn't affect anything it's it's more of just like your logbook it's going to uh, it's going to throw out a little bit um i i don't think there's anything you can do to to recalibrate it and i imagine even if you send it back to aqualung or any other uh, dive computer manufacturer you'll be hard going for them to um, uh, to recalibrate it because I think that sensor is like built into the uh, built into the, uh, the the microchips and all that kind of stuff so um, no I just kind of live with it as long as you know that it's kind of off then fine but um, it, I don't think I've ever looked at the uh, the temperature and like freaked out because it's incorrect on my uh, on my dive computer it just it is what it is, basically. And that's it for another week. Uh, thank you for listening, everybody. Uh, remember to head over to our website, scubadivermag.com. Check out all our awesome news and gear reviews. Um, yeah, all of the links to uh, anything I've spoken about today are going to be down in the description below. Uh, I say down as if this is a video. Uh, I mean, it is going out on YouTube. But if you're listening to this as a podcast, uh, I don't really know where the description is. Um, but yeah, it, any links will be in the description. Uh, of course, remember to like, share, subscribe, do all that good social media stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, head over to our YouTube channel, subscribe there and check out all of my latest videos. Uh, otherwise, yeah, thank you for listening, everybody. And of course, safe diving.